I'm glad that Madeline read an Ars Poetica. She quoted from um, Czeslaw Milos, his Ars Poetica. Those are poems, as many as you, of you know, about the art of writing poetry. And so this is Ars Poetica 100, I Believe. Poetry, I tell my students, is idiosyncratic. Poetry is where we are ourselves, though Sterling Brown said, every I is a dramatic I, digging in the clam flats for the shell that snaps, emptying the proverbial pocketbook. Poetry is what you find in the dirt in the corner, over here on the bus, God in the details, the only way to get from here to there. Poetry, and now my voice is rising, is not all love, 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 and I'm sorry, your dog died. <laughs> poetry, here I hear myself loudest. Poetry is the human voice. And are we not of interest to each other? Um, in the, the president's um, words um, uh, uh, about the light of the world um, that I'm going to turn to now to read from, it's not a book of poetry, but it's a book with poetry in it. It's a poet's book. It's not a book that I ever imagined that I would write, um, but it is a memoir that only a poet could have written. It came from the same place that poetry comes from, word by word, sound by sound, musical note by musical note, in very condensed musical short sections. It was a book that I wrote after the unexpected passing of my husband and the process of finding the road forward word by word, with human beings as my companions, with love as my companion, and with art as my companion. So I'm going to read a few sections from The Light of the World. The story begins in 1962, when two women in cotton lawn maternity shifts approached the end of their pregnancies, one in Asmara, Eritrea, one in Harlem, USA. The low-hanging moon of impending childbirth governs their days. The ones we may come to love have been born by the time we start longing for them. And so my beloved and I came onto this earth in March and in May of 1962, halfway around the world from each other. Then in 1996, we came together, one family who arrived in America as Eritrean refugees who had never been slaves the other who landed 100 and 200 and 300 years ago, slaves and free from Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean. Every beautiful day we lived, every single beautiful day. He who believed in the lottery, he who did not leave a large carbon footprint, he who never met a child he did not enchant, he who loved to wear the color pink. He whose children made him laugh until he cried. He who never told a lie. He who majored in physics, who knew the laws of the universe. He who wanted to win the lottery for me. We loved Jimmy Scott's version of the David Byrne song, Heaven. Heaven is a place where nothing ever happens. These days I picture heaven populated by the umber angels Ficre painted in abundance, but that seems too fanciful. I never truly believed in heaven and cannot manufacture it. Little Jimmy Scott's plaintiveness seems right when he sings, nothing ever happens. How better to describe the infinite solitude of the afterlife? When this kiss is over, it will start again. It will not be any different. It will be exactly the same, he sings. Each kiss is fixed. It is the same long kiss, but it will never change. That is the comfort, and that is the heartbreak. One night at bedtime, Simon asks if I want to come with him to visit Fikre in heaven. Yes, I say, and lie down on his bed. First you close your eyes, he says, and ride the clear glass elevator. Up we go. What do you see, I ask? God is sitting at the gates, he answers. What does God look like, I ask. Like God, he says. <laughs> now we go where daddy is. 
He has two rooms, Simon says, one room with a single bed and his books and another where he paints. The painting room is vast. He can look out any window he wants and paint. That room has four views, our backyard, the dock he painted in Maine, Asmara, and New Mexico. New Mexico, I ask. Yes, Simon says, the volcano crater with the magic grass. Ah, yes, I say, the caldera, where we saw the gophers and the jackrabbits and the elk running across, and Daddy called it the Velt. Yes, do you see it? And I do. The light is perfect for painting. His bed in heaven is a single bed. Okay, it's time to go now, Simon says, so down we go. You can come with me any time, he says. Thank you, my darling. I don't think you can find it by yourself yet, he says, but one day you will. I come out of my first Pilates class exhilarated, blood flowing, stretched, and tall. It is the first time in ages I lose myself and forget. My tears come fast and sting just after I think I cannot wait to get to the phone to call Fikre and tell him. The poet Rilke surprises me how true and contemporary he feels in the Book of Hours, poems which he wrote as received spiritual messages or prayers. He wrote, let everything happen to you, beauty and sorrow. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. For Rilke, God is the companion, the hand the reader is exhorted to take. Fikre is not my God, neither do I know who God is, but I find this for force in art, in poems, and the community I have made. When we met those many years ago, I let everything happen to me, and it was beauty. Along the road, more beauty and fear and struggle and work and learning and joy. I could not have kept Fikre's death from happening and from happening to us. It happened. It is part of who we are. It is our beauty and it is our terror. We must be gleaners from what life has set before us. If no feeling is final, there is more for me to feel. And so the story ends, or pauses, for we, as we know, it is all one long story. My sons and I have moved to New York City. Today we look out our window at the Hudson River and wait for another hurricane as the sky turns lavender and orange, fikre colors. When the rain is most dramatic, we fear him, feel him close. The boys grow taller than everyone around them and become young men. Their grandfather turns 80, and with my mother, they circle the wagons and leave their home in Washington, D.C., where I grew up and return to New York, their ancestral metropolis, to be extended family with us as Fikre always wanted it. New York is the place that called Fikre as well, a place with mythos, a place where everyone belongs. Now I live in a neighborhood of stage doors and students walking down the street with huge instrument cases. The dancers pirouette on Lincoln Center Plaza and clatter down the street in high fabulosity. They are the children making art. Fikre was one of the children at the Art Students League, but he was never a child and always a child. That rare combination true to his position on the Zodiac, ancient and brand new as anyone who knew him would say. I am in New York City where I was born where I have spent decades trying to return. Welcome home, I am told many times, even by people who do not know me or know that I was born in Harlem, USA, at 135th and 5th in the Riverton Apartments at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, where my father was also born. Fikre and I never made it here together. That was planned for when the children graduated from high school. Death sits in the comfortable chair in the corner of my new bedroom, smoking a cigarette. It is a he, sinuous and sleek, wearing a felt-brimmed hat. He is there when I wake in the middle of the night, sitting quietly, his smoke a visible curl in the New York lights that come in between the Venetian blind slats. At first, I am startled to see him. He sits so near, is so at home. But he doesn't move toward me. He simply cohabits, and so eventually I return to sleep. He isn't going anywhere, but he isn't going to take me either. In the morning, the chair is empty. 
Which is stronger, death sitting in the corner or life in New York City? Death or my teenage sons sleeping profoundly in the next room growing overnight? I love plans, my new friend Esther exults, and so do I, for nowadays I feel sometimes like plans are what stand between me and the end of my life. I'm not going to die overnight because next Wednesday I am going with Esther to see an auction of 19th century American documents at Swan Gallery. I am not going to die tonight because I already took the chicken out of the freezer and Simon loves roast chicken and rice for dinner and I promised him I would make it. I'm not going to die tonight because on Saturday Farah and I are bumbling, bundling up and going for a walk against the blustery winds along the river to continue the conversation we began almost 30 years ago when we were both in graduate school before I even knew my beloved Fikre. It's not easy to die, sweetie, Fikre used to say to me when I'd wake in a panic some nights. I've seen people survive and I know. I'd always had bad dreams and his words and presence were all that ever calmed me down. It's not easy to die. Life force is actually mighty and I have life force. It is not indelible, but it can behave like it is. We all die, but we don't die easily. Though it seemed he slipped away, it could not have been easy. The heart inside of him beat all the beats it was allocated, but in his 50 years, the man lived. Not nearly enough, but not insufficiently. He found his life's work thrice, as an activist, as a chef, and as a painter. He understood himself as something larger than himself his mighty extended family of origin, his beloved native land and its people. He found love and became part of a new extended family and a new people. He had children and made family, most important of all to him. A statue of Frederick Douglass stands at the quiet 77th Street entrance of the New York Historical Society, tall and mighty. He is someone who journeyed to freedom, I think, and I was married to someone who walked to freedom. The culmination of the freedom was love and family. That's all he did, that's what he did. I hear my voice to my children. Your father walked to freedom. At my father's 80th birthday, I tell the room that when Fikre and I met, he told me he was not interested in anyone who did not love and honor her parents. He found too much of that. In New York, I feel joy overwhelming, and this same gratitude for Fikre brought me here. I am sure of it, as sure as if he whispered in my ear, Go, Lizzie, you are so much braver than you realize. Take the children and go. What are the odds, we used to say, what are the odds that we would end up in the same place and fall in love? Once upon a time, halfway around the world, Two women were pregnant at the same time in very different places, and their children grew up and found each other. It happens every day. Thank you.